<laughs> so, who are you? Uh, I'm Jeff Browning uh, with F5. I'm a product manager here. No, uh, we're, we're not in Microsoft land again. How, how can they keep letting me off I, campus? I, I, how does that happen? <laughs> we're not in Microsoft now, but we, you know, some people are very good friends and work with Microsoft and other vendors. But uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, who are we with here? We're with the whole Dev Central team and a bunch of our tools and technologies groups. So I'll let those guys. Yeah, uh, Colin Walker, work with uh, the Dev Central team, uh, do uh, our rules and work with the API and that kind of stuff, work with the forums, try and help the users out when they have problems, that kind of stuff, as well as working with uh, partners to get larger solutions, that kind of stuff. Cool. And? I'm Joe Pruitt, a senior architect here. I've been at F5 since almost the beginning. Really? Um, He's an old time. I think I'm ranked <laughs> number seven. Now, now, what's your core business? So, when I think of F5, I don't think of anything like software. Or yeah, most people, well, just, most people think about uh, network and uh, layer four load balancing, that kind of stuff. That's you know, we started there, and I should really let jet, uh, people that have been here seven years talk about this. But um, a lot of the stuff we're pushing, especially on Dev Central, is we have a full scripting language on the product called iRules, and we have a, a SOAP API that's exposed called iControl. And so it, we're really pushing the idea of making the network part of the application layer, right? So yeah. it's an intelligent device, not just a packet pusher. Now, one thing I noticed, networking companies are always located next to railroads. And I don't know <laughs> if you can see that. And I, I have a feeling that that actually is a story in and of itself, because uh, the fibers are laid across uh, along the railroad right of ways, right? I, I don't think that's indicative of our network here. Oh, really? <laughs> in Silicon Valley, it is. All the, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I have pictures of, uh, yeah. of uh, the guys laying the fiber right underneath the railroad tracks in Silicon Valley. And, uh, of course, uh, Leland Stanford was a railroad guy and um, was an ex-vice president of the Central Pacific Railroad. And he has the original uh, golden spike you know, located at Stanford. Wow. So, really? So this whole uh, net, this right whole uh, world of the internet is tightly inter interwoven with the r world of the railroad. <laughs> wow, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Four applies for sure. Yeah, the, the best thing is when you see actual airplanes rolling by on the trains. You look at a yeah. meeting and you see these fuselage just like rolling by. It's a little bit overwhelming. It's like yeah. kind so of. So you get the ferries. So we span yeah. all the transportation. Yeah. 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 So anyways, what are we doing here? <laughs> kind, of like all, kind of like all the protocols we get. Other than talking about the, uh, <laughs> no, the old days. Talking about railroad <laughs> history here, yeah. No, we're here to show you some of the stuff that uh, kind of differentiates us from all the other networking vendors. and. Typically, application developers don't really think of the network as it's uh, thinks of it's like throwing it over the fence to the network guys to handle that kind of stuff. We're trying to bridge the gap between the app developers and the uh, the network engineers, network operators, trying to build a more reliable network, allowing applications to kind of flow smoothly. And, wow. and um, so that's well, kind and of that, and that matters to us. We just announced our new services strategy yesterday, and you know, obviously Microsoft's moving from a a company that builds software that just runs on one computer to uh, right. A company that builds services that run on networks, right? So yeah, and rumor has it Microsoft's a user of ours. So. Yep. <laughs> well, I have a feeling you invited me here for a purpose. Yeah. So. Well, and Charles is along with us too, by the way. Hi, Charles. We have another person. Yeah. Yep. Another really guy here. And who? Um, who are you? I'm Calvin Rowland. I uh, I guess I'm the I'm the token business guy. <laughs> group, but uh, you know, I my responsibility is managing the partnership with Microsoft. So what that means, as far as this effort is concerned, it's really you know the core of what I do is, you know, if these guys have an idea, uh, something that is of value technically or from a business perspective with the API or the I rules, uh, and we need to hook up with a specific product group, uh, server product group typically over Microsoft. It's uh, you know it's my butt that's on the line to, to make sure that communication uh, happens. Sure. So I spend a lot of time on the 520 bridge. Okay. <laughs> right. No problem. And you guys have some demos to show us. Yeah. You want like What do you think? Should we? Yeah, let's go to your offices. Hey, Joe's. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So we'll shut off the camera for a second as we get over to your offices. Now, now this is the coolest cube I've ever seen. <laughs> I, you know, any cube with a with a, a closet for your servers. That, that's a cool. Yeah. That's yeah. why I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's all kinds of cool stuff here. We'll have Joe walk through this, but uh, yeah. if there's not enough firepower right now, then you know, you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So. so the thing that we were talking about too is while well, Joe's getting ramped up, one of the things we're trying to do is really, really show the enable that notion of having the network as an extended service yeah. to the application. Because you know, candidly, if there's no application, there's no need for a damn network. Yeah. Right. And you know, load balancing while helpful and figuring out how to direct traffic to different servers to keep them available is like 
it's important, but it's just a small piece of it, right? Yeah. And so what we've done is, uh, and Joe will get into it, and we'll talk about this too, uh, our new technology and platforms of full proxy architecture, super fast, zero copy proxy architecture. So not only can we pass stuff around and balance load, yeah. but what we're doing is we can actually intuitively see things within anything in the header payload and make smarter decisions with it. And so what's cool is we expose that through an inline scripting language called iRules, okay. uh, as well as a SOAP API. So every box, so every, these things here, right, all yeah. of these devices, you see here, these are some of our application switches and stuff. They're all actually a SOAP stack. Okay. So everything that you can do through the GUI or command line is exposed as WSDL. And actually, Joe's, wow. uh, I'll let Joe talk about it a little more. He's the kind of the father. He. Uh, is the architect See in there? I'm closing this because it's really loud. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got oh, we've got our own heating system over here too. Oh yeah. Kind of radiates <laughs> off. This. As long as the AC doesn't go out here, this is really nice. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Well, you know what? I got an uh, AC switch right over here. Excellent. <laughs> override. No, it all started out back in 2000, 2001, when um, you know we, we we had two different devices here. We started out as a load balancing company, yeah. doing um, ser basically server farm load balancing for the e-commerce. Dot com boom. Yeah. Right? So you get you set up a website. You gotta distribute load back to the servers. Yeah. Look so, at me. <laughs> Forget look the camera. At you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said look at the camera. Like, you know. No, I said look at me. So back at the uh, the e-commerce boom, right? Yeah. So um, that's where our origins are. We've got a load, yeah. local area device and a wide area device that deals with multiple data centers. Right. That kind of stuff. So our devices had to talk to each other. So we we had an iterative process communication protocol in Corba back then. Yes. Back in the time before kind of before the first soap thing came out. Right. Um, and so we said, okay, let's let's roll this out and let's um, expose this to our customers and partners so that they can have the same interaction with our devices that we could. So as a natural extension, in 2001, we um, put out our first soap interface on top, and it was basically a Corba mapping to all of our Corba methods. And since then, Corba is long gone. Nobody's yep. using it anymore. So it's off, since we moved to the new platform, it's pure, pure soap. Um, I think we're up to on the new latest release. I think I, I don't know if I can claim this, but I think we probably got one of the largest um, API implementations of any vendor. Close to twenty four hundred methods on our current Whoa. switch. Why do you need so many? Because it, it gives you granular access to every piece of configuration on the system, every statistic, any any kind of thing you need so to do. So is it the new command line? It's you could build you could redo the command lines with our soap calls. You can redo the GUI, you can make your own GUI, and that's a, in fact that's what a lot of our customers are doing. Is that they're taking, um, building their own sub apps. Like if you, if any, if you, if you're aware of what like a load balancer, there's a lot of features on it, right? And a lot of times the network guys don't want to um, give off access to all those features to all their end users. They want a user that performs a function. Let's say he take his job is to take servers down and reprovision the servers. Right. And do it without making like big mistakes with right. like fat fingering dot ten and dot hundred on right. command line and they want to make it easy and goify it and stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. Yeah. The, the command lines are for the network guys. They love them. Um, but it's horrible when you're trying to have somebody who's a novice, not very trained, right, who has to do some repetitive stuff. Um, and you can get a real disaster there when your websites go down. Tell, so, tell me about a customer of yours. Don't name the customer, but tell me what they would use your system for. What, what does your system enable them to do that they weren't able to do before? Okay, we got several. I'll talk about Big IP for one. Big IPs are load balancing. Start start out with load balancing. It's really an application security um, device right now. We could do SSL termination, offloading SSL from the servers. We could do HTTP caching. So basically, perf optimizing the performance. The goal there is to let um, your applications and the user, the best user experience to your applications, whether it's by um, cookie persist persisting user sessions to the back end servers, right? Um, so that's typically what we'll use our local security device. It's, it's um, you know, crypto, that kind of thing. So offloading a lot of that stuff, making your servers a lot faster, let you um, build. Um, you know, in the, in the whole SOA architecture, right? You've got um, want to be able to deploy services, right? So typically use ours as a um, kind of spawning, mecha spawning mechanism to, to fan out to the different services. Okay. We've got a, an application security module that acts like a, an XML firewall, or an HTML firewall. So it does um, a form level enforcement, stuff like that. We've got a SSL VPN, which is um, you know, 
as you know, an SSL VPN. It allows you to secure access to networks. Right. Um, what kind of distinguishes us and a lot of our products is that we're really focusing on the user base. So we've got client-side APIs for, for our, our FirePass, which is our SSL device. So I've got an example of that where you, if you don't want to use the um, typical application plugin, you can build your own hooks into your your secure tunnels from within your application. So, so, so a good example of that is say you're building some like thick client or smart client application, right, that uh, users want to be able to access, you know, maybe it's a financial or trader application. Instead of going through the usual IPsec VPN approach, which is like fraught with configuration challenges and stuff, this can actually be wired in transparently and okay. uses SSL to tunnel in creates all these credentials that works from anywhere without the configuration challenges. So it's a really cool client API to do that kind of stuff. So right. Got an example yeah. of a, um, a... Yeah, why don't you show us some of these? Well, yeah, give you, you asked about one customer example. Yeah. I'll give you a quick one. Not on here yet, but okay. um, if you go into like the grocery stores, you see the coin machines. We've got a customer who uses that, and they're piggybacking off the local Wi-Fi network, but they've coded in our client-side SSL connection into their actual vending machines. So that they can phone home and let them know when supplies are, and we've got examples of you know, like candy bar vending machine types of things too okay. that they're coding that into. Now, so. since since Charles is here, Charles uh, helped write or wrote a good chunk of Channel Nine, which is an app okay. that lives above your stack. You know, yeah. Right. What would a developer like that be able to build with with your system that he couldn't otherwise build? Well, it talked about building like a, a web-based application. Mm -hmm. Does it matter to anybody who lives that high up? In the it, stack? it should because really, um, currently now, when application developers are writing apps, they're not thinking about how they're going to be deployed, right? right? So what we're trying to push out is is hooking in service information, health information into your applications, and funneling those back into the network instead of the network actually doing a polling. Have it be a push from the servers. So, 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 component, so a component on the site could be wired to proactively tell the device, I fired 25 of these exceptions at the last minute that say they're of class 3 or whatever. You know what, this could be symptomatic of big problems on this server or this cluster of servers and maybe what you want to do is go and fail over to a different data center or different uh -huh. locations or you know, things like persistence, that's another thing where if you have, say, a persistent connection where you've got to do it, instead of having to code persistence in your application tier, yeah. just say, offload it, let the network handle it. We do like cookie persistence and session ID persistence and stuff like that. So it lets the server serve and lets developers not have to code a lot. Well, I mean, you're, 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 you're sending down it's your web side. services. Away from the yeah, yeah. I'm talking about web services, so yeah. I would just consume these services and I could write against them. I could write a web based network administration utility. Right, exactly. Well, you I mean, that's, you that's certainly do a web based administration utility. Uh, one of the, and that's, you know, kind of, in my mind, it kind of falls into almost the uh, architect level of things where the SOAP stack really, really comes in handy is when you're architecting, architecting applications, uh, you can build the products in, they uh, are able to act in real time based on the information that you provide them, right? But as far as people like Charles are concerned, where they're building uh, the website and having to deal with things, you can offload a lot of the things that you might have to otherwise put in the code to our systems. We have uh, also one of the other things is iRules, right? Full scripting language based on Tickle on the system, right? And because we're a full proxy and where we sit in the network, it's a very interesting place to be. Yeah. So we see the entire packet, not just the header, the entire payload. So one of the interesting things that we put up on Dev Central, which is our uh, user based site, um, is a credit card number scrubber. It's just an example we've been using because it's a pretty great real world example. So you deal with, you know, on the, on the internet, there's tons of e commerce people, you know, a lot of financial institutions, that kind of thing. And uh, they're passing credit card information, social security numbers, sensitive data all over the place, right? right? Well, since we can see all those packets, as long as they're being forwarded through the system, we can go in and not only find the number string, find a string that's the right number of characters to match a card, but we can pass it through an algorithm on the system to see whether it's a valid credit card, not only whether it's valid, see what kind of credit card it is, and then scrub those things out. Okay. And so log we, it. Yeah, we, we, we can log, log it. And log it and make sure you know the offending IP address yeah. where yeah. it came from. <laughs> log, log it, make sure you know where it came from, make sure it doesn't get outside the network, that kind of stuff, all in real time. 
you know, you, you never you never have to touch it, right? That kind of stuff. Yeah. And it gets very very scalable. One of the cool new things that actually just came out in one of the newer releases is the ability to retry, right? So instead of making a request to a server, server says, you know, I don't have that page, sends a 404 back or whatever, right? We can catch that if you code right on the system with with the iRules, you can catch that and rewrite that request and send it to a different server before the client realizes it, right? So the client never sees a redirect or anything, it's just one connection, but you can go to multiple servers, multiple data centers, whatever it takes, to get the actual packet passed back through. What, what yes. kinds of things does, do developers need to do to make great services that work in this new model? I, I give you, I'll give you some example. Basically what Colin's getting at here is that a lot of a lot of the application in your logic, the busy work you're putting into your backend servers, whether it's um, session management, cookie management, um, whether it's redirects, that kind of stuff, try, you can offload some of that stuff and let your application developers worry about writing the applications. And another example is is application deployment. And let's say you want you've got a new server and you got to put a new instance of it. You um, you allow code into that application the ability to register itself with the network and deregister itself if you want this. If, you know, this it deregister itself, right? Yeah. If you want to take it out or upgrade the software. So when you've got a server farm, you want to upgrade them. It would be great just to cop when you start copying files. Your software realizes that your files being overwritten on the system. It deactivates itself from the network, and when the files are done copying, it reactivates itself. So you don't have the network guys involved at all. Yeah. You've got the application guys, or you've got you've got I've got a new server and I've got to install a new instance of, of my software on there because it's distributing it farther, right? Yeah. Or, or a server goes down in, in an SOA environment. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the key, the, one of the key things that people are doing is, you know, I mean, you, I don't know, how, how often do you guys, well, you probably don't want to, you probably have updates that you do to the oh, site sure. pretty regularly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. we have so bugs all the time. Exactly, yeah, I mean, we, they're reality, they, they happen, you got to roll out new code. Well, if you put it in a highly available environment where you've virtualized a number of nodes or servers, you need to be able to orchestrate that process of bringing servers in and out of production and still make sure you're available. Right, and that's kind of tricky, you know. So the old models, you do command line stuff where people, you know, okay, stop connections, bleed connections, set a timer when it's done, pull it out of the loop, and do the update process. Well, we've got customers that now hook our API to our device into their code management system. So they hit go, and we do rolling updates where they'll bring the first five servers in their big pool of 20 or 30 servers yeah. out of the loop, push new bits out to them, restart them, bring them up, and then it hits another event that says, you know what, we're available now, send now new requests to this site to these new hot servers and consistently do that. So people aren't doing all this, frankly, brain, uh, mind-numbing kind of maintenance stuff that the network guys don't want to do, the application team would like to be able to at least be able to do without having to wait six hours for a network request to manage this stuff. And so it's a lot about automation, a lot yeah. of the stuff that really makes it easier to to how, deploy applications quickly. How are businesses changing in relationship to the data center? Like Google is a good example, right? Yeah. Google, one of Google's real competitive advantages is the very cheap machines yeah. that they go and throw into yeah. racks and they can grow very virally that yeah. way all over the world and share data through data centers. Yeah, it's, and I have a feeling you guys over, see yeah. that see in a time. very uh, granular level. We what, what kinds of things are you noticing in the data centers that it's enabling new kinds of businesses? So what, what we're seeing is, you know, you start talking about grid infrastructure and that kind of stuff. And grid is the physical network resource tier below a service-oriented architecture that's web services, right? Yeah. And what happens is we see a lot of people with um, these. We have a customer that we've talked to in the past that's using iControl, which is the API, into our devices. And because we can switch and route traffic based upon demand, availability, health, security things, virtually anything that you want to define as a pattern or profile for traffic, for web traffic, or any IP traffic for that matter, it could be SIP for a VoIP phone, right? But um, what they've done is they use Big IP, they call it their smart hard drive controller because these cheap devices are their smart hard drives, yep. right? And so we, through our API, can talk back and forth in a much more intelligent manner between the endpoints, the nodes, and the actual network device that does the security enforcement, and the persistence, the routing, all that kind of stuff. So it's actually enabling all kinds of stuff. And the crazy benefit that I didn't we probably should have put together, but I don't want to take credit for it because it's actually, you know, it's always talking to customers. The customers always know better, right? So what's happened is in the past when they went with these big monolithic servers, yeah. 
for an application that maybe had 10 servers. They had significant sums of money invested in those, so you have to buy the super expensive support from your hardware vendors and your software vendors because if one goes down, yeah. it's like you know 8 or 10% of your processing power. Now, they have lower costs, they have lots of racks of these things, and, and it's really any vendor can do it. It's yeah. not like any platform is you know more expensive or not. Some have benefits based on architecture, so it's a Windows or other flavor type of world. It doesn't really matter. No, but um, having scalability at, at a granular level is real important because, you know, like we were just talking before when we were out in the hall, my wife's weblog in three weeks got 30,000 hits, right? That's or awesome. 30,000 yeah. visits, right? Yeah. You have no idea out there if you put a hundred new services, which one's going to get really hot, you know, and which one is going to turn into the Craigslist or the eBay or the or the Google or the exactly. or the MSN, right? That's you know, exactly. You guys are all nodding their yeah. heads. Well, like, it's, yeah, it's yeah. the unexpected success, right? And yeah. in, a, in a web services world, not just the typical website world where people had like they put up their web shingle and all of a sudden you got tons of hits, but in a web services world where you have composite services requesting things and someone in a financial sector winks a funny way and all of a sudden all, everybody has to go log into, you know, a, you know whatever their, you know, financial management vendor of choice is and yeah. make some trade. Well, that happens and you've got to be able to not only be able to grab resources, bring them into a pool to support that application, but that's another piece of what we do is uh, multi-data data center traffic management. Yeah. So, like disaster recovery. How do you spill over or how do you create topography groups based upon where people reside to determine fastest route to get to the data center that is a redundant application? There's a ton of stuff yeah. like that that, you know, our, our comment is, you know, it's a secure, fast, available. Yeah. Uh, you know, so we don't make the applications, they just, I think, run better yeah. with us in the, in the loop, you know, so that's it. So. Now, I was just down in Silicon Valley and I saw a new startup there. And I think it's called zdents.com. Hmm. Okay. And he's using components and data from other places, right? He has a, a Google ad component. He has a mapping component. He has data coming in from, I don't know, Craigslist or somewhere that yeah. he's getting it from. Yeah. And I think that's the future of the websites, right? We're going to see all sorts of components. Like eBay will make a Skype component, and it will be on my page. Yeah. And, and Microsoft will make a, a bunch of components that you put on your page that add new functionality. And I sense a new world coming out where all of these components will share the attention data that the uh, user is giving to the system. For instance, that website knows I'm going dancing in San Francisco on Saturday, right? Yeah. Why couldn't it share that information with all the other services on that page kind of in a live way? And how widget will wiring, your, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. It, it, through XML web services, how will yeah. your networks help build that kind of world where I'm going to share data with Amazon, share it with Starbucks, share it with some blogger who is going to use that to build a new component, yeah. you know? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think part of it is that we'll be able to better understand the flows of traffic because we're the only product in our space that really can intelligently understand everything in the header and the payload. So think of it as knowing everything at the atomic layer. And I don't know, you'd probably even be able to help more on this. but. Because we'll know that and we can actually say grab a cookie or, or generate a cookie and pass data on to other applications as part of requests so that we can, because one thing we do is we can transform traffic. Yeah. And so based upon requests, embed that in an application request that go out that might pass metadata about users. I, I mean, we kind of get into blue sky futures there, but it's not that far away. About, I don't think <laughs> it is. And, and frankly, there's stuff that we do where, you know, things will come in and we actually can take hold of traffic dramatically transform that traffic so that it's not anything what looked like the customer's request. So the client request versus form something on the back end on the outbound path, look at it, transform back to what should be expected by the client and give it to them. So as people make these requests out or spawn them, I think there's certainly opportunities for us to be able to understand what people are doing and modify and eject metadata and bring that back and, and, and composite it. But the point is, you're talking about a network device and network technology that's starting to do that versus stuff that's always done in every node of every application everywhere, which makes management and deployment so much more feasible. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, you've got all of these services that are cropping up, and yeah. especially if they're using web services as a medium. Yeah, I think it's and gonna, they all are. It's going to hit yeah. really hard. You're going to hit bandwidth issues. You're going to get server resource issues. So anything you can do, like with our products being able to do either site-to-site -site compression, WAN compression, WAN optimization, that kind of thing. Um, as these things scale out, you're going to need those types of features plugged into different pieces of your network to yeah. kind of help them.
I, on the internet, we see events happen. You know, 9-11 was a good example. 9-11 uh, not only took out the infrastructure that was stored in the World Trade Center, but it caused a huge amount of traffic. And I noticed all the news pages uh, for a while there had blank home pages or had home pages with very few words on it saying, hey, we're just getting slammed right now. We have way too much traffic and we don't know how to handle that intelligently. Um, how are the new networks going to react to that kind of extremely high load because of some event that happens in the well, world. That's who our salespeople go, go to right away, right? Because yeah. these are the guys who don't, don't have the, you know, either multi-data center or multi, you know, across the world different um, uh, high availability of their servers. A lot of these guys are housing in one data center yep. and disasters like that, you got the, if the pipe goes, then you're out of luck, or if power's gone from a whole city, then uh, yeah, we were you're the out PDC of luck. was in Los yeah. Angeles. We, we, and we were the whole down city, there. Yeah, yeah. We were the, whole, yeah. the whole city we went away. In, we're like, what the hell happened here? It's like no power. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually, though, there's an example for that. Um, you know, you talk about new networks. I don't want to say old, because but it's even our pre, our, our 4.x architecture is pre this one. We have a customer. It's a large media news site that yeah. um, during 9/11. It had about 45 percent availability yeah. during all that stuff, right? And then, um, really interesting during the, uh, I believe it was the Olympics in Utah. Was it? It was. It was. Wasn't it Utah? The Winter Olympics with some of the speed skating stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the Apollo Ono yeah. incident where there was question about who who should win, you know, because of yeah. a, a toss of one of the other competitors. Um, we uh, were sitting in front of that site. We hadn't been before. It brought our technology in, and on that. Day, they had massive denial of service attacks from the region where the, I think one of the skaters was from that had gotten tossed. Um, in addition, they saw the amount of traffic on that site. It was categorically all the way down the line, very similar to 9-11, and they were seeing 99.8% availability at the edge. Okay. So, I mean, that's just intelligent traffic management. That's before we even start getting into the real amazing stuff that we're doing with our current architecture. So, yeah. But now, uh, we're, I would ask only... I don't necessarily see where web services fits into that picture. So when you talk about, yeah. I mean, that's a different, a different level of, of, right. your, of your of your technology. Yeah. You're right. So that's so that's at um, the standard networking side of it, right? And the load balancing, how do you deal with that? Where the where the, the web services stuff comes into is when you start dealing with mission critical applications that are really traditionally flying over an unreliable network. You know, how do you make sure that you're securing it, you're making sure it's available, that you're passing it through, um, and and doing things like Colin was talking about, retrying applications, like if you have a, a service request that hits a failure, for instance, today we can capture um, SOAP exceptions yeah. and retry those things. And so we natively have an XML filter that looks at that stuff and says, all right, here's a SOAP request, it came back exception, let's fire it off somewhere else to make sure that it's available. And that's going to be the challenge with web services because of the loosely coupled nature there are challenges. So that's that's kind of going from the load balancing, which was circa two, three years ago, to saying now it's this application fluent. So if you've got, uh, say, the financial, like, FIX protocol, which is financial information exchange, yeah. looking for specific user IDs and being able to pin sessions to that, and it could include web service calls that are going on, and looking for SOAP exceptions, saying, ah, SOAP exception the response, how do we pass it? So, so that's so kind of... Words, I could as a network administrator working remotely in the situation, I could just talk to the directly to the device right. using oh, web services. Right. And I could say, hey, give me a list of all the exceptions. If I could write logic to say if it's this exception type, you know, right. well, that's what's cool. So you build web services onto the hardware. I'm just trying to reiterate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Better than yeah. that is the the idea is if it were done correctly, you wouldn't have to be working remotely, right? Is even if there were these exceptions and things went wrong, the your you would have programmed in advance if X, Y, and Z occurs, then perform these actions, right? So you would have programmed in your monitoring system to account for that kind of stuff. So, uh, in, a, in a simple scripting language that you've created. Exactly. Excellent. So, so you would tie into our systems, and your monitoring system would say, okay, I'm seeing these different you know, characteristics on the network right now. This is bad, you know, mayday, right? And then you could roll in servers from elsewhere. You could apply a ratio. You could apply connection limiting. Like Joe said, anything that's you can do through the GUI, right? So it's really, really minute control over every feature that's on there. And, you know, between the, uh, 
web services layer and the eye rolls, which is the language you're talking about, it's pretty incredible amount of control you have over the device. Uh, the device, not just the device, and the traffic going through it, right? Wow. So the Olympics example, right? Uh, the the way SOA ties into that, um, it's to show it's not just networking. Is sure, a lot of networking devices can handle a lot of traffic. They can, you know, if something fails, they can go to the next node. But we don't have to wait for it to fail. It can report its usage to our device and say, "I just passed seventy percent, or whatever you define, right?" It can tell us how it wants us to react, right? So your servers, all of a sudden, instead of waiting for a server to go down and rolling to the next one in line and then it getting pummeled too, because there's just so much traffic going to that one, right? You can now have your systems set up intelligently so that, oh, look, we passed X number of hits per second or X number of you know per CPU usage or whatever it happens to be. Okay, well, I know that means these things in this situation because I'm getting this kind of request. Great. So go grab three more servers, pull them in, set a connection limit, make sure things stay running. Right. That's I think that's a lot where the 99.8% comes from. Is it's not it's because you're not waiting for failures. It's yeah. proactive yeah. versus reactive. Yeah. Right. When, when there's intelligence built in and when you have the ability to control things before there's a problem, you stay away from disaster recovery, and that's really what we're trying to do. Right? These, these aren't just ideas, too. I mean, we have tangible examples of customers doing this. I mean, I had to step away a little bit. I don't know if we talked about. You know, some of the you know the recent eye rolls contest that we yeah, had, where yeah. we had a flurry of, of, of you know people in our development community um, uh, uh, sending in you know their eye roll uh, uh, or their eye control application. These are things that are in production. You know, problem noted, um, uh, and here's how we solved it. You know, using the things that Call and Jeff and, and Joe were talking about. Yeah, you we can had, read about these on your site. We announced yeah. the winners yeah. actually we Monday. Monday. Yeah, really? yeah, if you go up to uh, uh, the the devcentral.f5.com. Yeah. It's a typical community site. Um, we've got forums and things like that, some, some video blogs as well up there. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, this so is Dev yeah. Central here, yeah. So you there, we announced uh, there's a iRule contest showcase. There's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of sample that everybody's contributed and said, here's a rule that won. There's one, I think, that deals with like web services specifically as far as how do you deal with um, handling uh, SSL for um, web services, yeah, stuff that, like that. This is an interesting, that, really cool a, example. That's a good, uh, interesting problem because with um, web services, if you're going to um, SSL offload that, URI is actually built into the, the payload, so you got to mm -hmm. go and tweak the HTTPS to HTTP if it's going to match on your back-end server. So a lot of um, SSL termination devices don't have the smarts to be able to do that because it's going to come in as HTTPS on their server, yep. and the web service implementation is going to go puke, uh, I don't understand that, I'm HTTP. So Got we had it. an example of a customer that wrote some code to do that. Interesting. And they could deploy it on all kinds of nodes when they build this application, deploy it, yeah. or have to rebuild all of their applications, or they write, what is it, like 12 or 13 lines of code and manage it in one location, which is pretty sweet. So, yeah. so you guys you got some demos? Some demos? Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, we'll start with, uh, I, I, I illustrate a little bit of... Um, how you integrate with Visual Studio. Okay. All right. Oh, that'll be good. Yeah. yeah. My um, focus is still a little wacky, but uh, we'll try it. Oh, it's an LCD screen here. All right. Yeah. Um, since, uh, again, all of, all of our devices have a full WSDL um, interface for all of our 2,400 plus messages. Okay. So let's, um, I'll hook up. Let me see if I can get better focus this way. Oh. Can't. Talk. This camera's going back to Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a bigger resolution? No, 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 that's fine. <laughs> so you just put. With so the, I'm going to point to one of our uh, big IP devices. Yeah. And um, since we've got, here's all of the different categories of our interfaces. Local LB would be local load balancing. Pools are pools of servers. Yeah. Um, so if you want to get into. See, my focus is just not working very well. Interesting. I'm so sorry. you would dig in, and if you wanted to write some code that actually modified with pool members, which would be back in servers in a server farm, yep. you could click on this. It'll download. Now, this is an issue I've got with Visual Studio. Let's see if it's been fixed. But it, oh, it worked. Okay. So it gives you all the documentation and stuff. Yeah. Um, so then you can go and add this into your application, and, um, and then from within Visual Studio, right, you, you've got all the IntelliSense and everything. Oh, that's that's cool. right in. So an example I've got here, this is, uh, I don't have a slide for it, but this application is 
our, our, our web service stack is not just one directional. We also have an eventing web service interface that comes out. Okay. So you can ha build an application that can subscribe to events, and then yep. you write your, your own web service to receive those events. It's kind of like SNMP traps, Got it. but using web services. Yep. So it makes for kind of a fun demo, but it, it's good for um, real-time alerting of any kind of system level issue. So okay. I'll, I'll show you that, that yeah. app that I've got running here. So this is hooking up to my big IP. Um, I've got, I've created a, let's see. So you just hit modify on there. I created a subscription here. This is all in our SDK, by the way. Okay. So this shows you all the event types that you can subscribe to on our system if you're familiar with the networking uh, uh, like lingo. Right, um, so like event type pool, yeah. what does that show you? That would, that would show you anything that's manipulated, that's changed or has happened to a pool object, which is a pool is a group of servers. Okay. So in my example here is I'm going to tie in a node address, which is an actual physical address of a backend server. Okay. So, so a, I, a typical application that you see out there might have 50 servers or 100 sure. servers? Sure. Yep. So this, um, uh, or you can look at my machine here that'll have one server. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it illustrates the point, right? Cool. Um, so what I did is I created a subscription on here. Yep. And uh, actually, if we go back into modify, I pointed it to my Linux machine that's running Perl. As a hey, SOAP hey, endpoint. Why okay. are you guys using right. Linux? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's to show interoperability, right? No. Um, I can run, it's just as easy to run the Perl on no, Windows. I'm just kidding. Um, I wanted to show multiple machines. So I've got my Windows machine running Visual Studio with a client that's doing the configuration. Yep. Big IP is sending out um, the web service calls to a, SOAP, or to a SOAP implementation written in Perl. Okay. And it can be on Windows if you want. Yeah. I actually do all my stuff on Windows, but it's easier to run uh, stuff good in the save. Good save there. <laughs> So anyway, so what this will do is it's going to point out. So what I'm going to do is go into my yeah. big IP, um, and we'll go go into the back in, the nodes, which yeah. are back end servers, and I've got my app to forward to my phone. Okay. So I've got the subscription set up for uh, a 10 second thing. So let's see if within 10 seconds it gets forwarded through. So what happened is. I'm going to emulate a server going down. Yeah. I, I physically did it, but you, um, again, this shows the, the point of if something changes within the system, the message will be filtered in, it was matched to the subscription, it's going to send the web service call back out yep. to whatever endpoint you implement, and then get forwarded to your... Oh, there it goes. Cool. So you just got it? I did. So there we go. Node address modified. Not the not the best uh, text yeah. here, but it's just an SMS message. But you see that the address that I specified, 149, has been changed. So um, it, it just shows some of the, um, the the cool power and the extensibility that, that you could do and, and the ease of development with this stuff. It's just just incredible. Awesome. So then and then one more point here is to, okay. to feature back on our um, our, our development site, um, Dev Central. Yep. Um, we've got um, our SDK is available from download there, so okay. we've got full documentation for all 2,400 plus methods and how they all work together. The URL on that is devcentral.com? Uh, devcentral.f5.com. F5, okay. Yeah. Now you can go to f5.com and there's probably going to be a devcentral. There's right a devcentral link right on top, yeah. Great. Um, so the, some of the features we've got on our site, we, we kind of took off your video deal and yep. starting off with the... Um, the uh, PDC, we went down and we talked to a bunch of your guys and oh, had some guys come to the booth and didn't catch you when you were walking by. I saw you oh. at Doc Holidays, right? We were right next to us. <laughs> yep. But um, so our goal here is to kind of get some of our customers and partners and uh, vendors and, and we got a bunch of the guys from Microsoft talking about some of the different technologies. Very cool. Um, yeah, Michael Reese. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, Paul Vick over there, he was, he was awesome. Paul Vick, yeah. yeah Paul Vick, he was great. Think, yeah. got the biggest pull from one of his VBA um, um, blogs. Very cool. So again, we're, we're trying to just build a community here around the networking world and the application guys are trying to tie that stuff together, which really no other networking vendor is, is reaching out and doing now. And, and it's, it's given us a good, strong pull from the user. Well, that's really cool. And, and what's really cool about it is in the forums, yep. we're actually seeing something that I don't think has emerged anywhere. I mean, it sounds kind of grandiose, but I think we're really changing the way things work in enterprise IT. Because in the past, there's like, and everybody knows that there's the network team and there's the applications team. And what we're really trying to do is break down those walls by realizing the network can bring 
some capabilities to the application developers and the architects to do some things that a the applications shouldn't have to do and they can help make it a better partnership, right? Yeah. And it sounds all fuzzy, you know, warm and fuzzy, but it really is that. And so by providing a community site where people can register for free and go in the forums and stuff. What's cool is we're seeing now people that probably used to not get along so much mm -hmm. actually collaborating somewhat anonymously, but sometimes pretty per, you know personally through direct messaging and things like that on ways to make the network and the applications work a lot more cohesively. And the result is all of the great ROI story that everyone likes to talk about, but frankly just things just work better. Uh, and support kind of the changes because where it gets really sticky is you start deploying these huge grid environments as you were talking about in SOA. The rate of change in the data center is going to happen at these just phenomenal rates that people haven't seen before. So you can't have people running around with like, you know, levers like the railroad tracks that here switching tracks. You know, yeah. stuff's going to be happening so quickly and there's going to be so many tracks that if you can't have ways like an API to automate functions and, and iRules and, and a device that's smart enough to see what's going on in the traffic, you're not going to be able to actually respond to the change quickly enough and yeah. it's just going to break down. So what's cool about DevCentral is a place where everybody can come together and kind of work on that stuff. So That was a cool example of that. We had a guy, and it's the same company, but we had a guy that uh, was at the PDC, he was an application developer, and he came and talked to us a little bit about what we do, about iRules, possibilities that, with that kind of you know technology, and he got really interested and said, you know, I don't deal with the networking applications, but I know we have your product, I know that we can make use of this, and I think it would make my application a lot easier to code, I'm going to have my network guy get a hold of you. So we gave him a card, gave him the website, DevCentral, and he, we, a week later we saw the network guy make a username, log into devcentral.f5.com, come and say, hey, our application guy asked this question and you posted a video answer to it and I have a few more follow-up questions. So it really did work. It was really a great proof point to see that the application developer was now taking into account the things that could be done on the network device, right? Yeah. And the networking guy was coming to us to figure out how he can help facilitate that. It was just a great thing to see. It's very cool. Very cool. A lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. So um, obviously we encourage people to check it out. But, uh, but thanks. It's, great, yeah, it's a great innovation for web services to see them actually built into a device. So these guys are very these, interesting. These guys are doing the magic. Actually, a whole team of people here does a bunch of stuff. But it's yeah. uh, it's exciting. We it's fun. Right. It's fun working with technology that really actually solves problems and isn't you know just technology for technology's sake. So yeah, I got real lucky. A little bit of history is back in '99. Um, I was pushing for an XML interface onto our boxes, <laughs> yeah. right? And um, <laughs> You know, the core of our engineers are all hardcore um, kernel developers. So, like, XML, no, no, Corba is the way to go, right? And we were using Corba internally anyway. So, um, I kind of got talked out of that a little bit. And I'm kind of glad because we would have implemented a full XML before SOAP came out. And then we've had to re re rewrite and redo everything, and that would have messed everything up. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we actually pushed ours out in 2001, which was pretty darn close to when um, you know the first uh, specs went out for SOAP. So now, can I uh, can the system uh, build RSS feeds of key alerts, and can I be a guy who just watches the uh, system for uh, in my RSS aggregator for events that are like, hey, we notice this data center is getting slammed, you know, so it can that spit out an building RSS an RSS, feed? RSS uh, proxy for our uh, interfaces it, it, is it, interesting, and that's, that's something cool you could pretty easily build with our APIs as well is, is to uh, have, have it live and dynamically pull up any kind of error information as an RSS feed. Yeah. I haven't done it, but that that make a pretty good sample. I, maybe I'll look into doing that. I always have to add, ask people about RSS. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, actually, you know, you know, actually Div Central is, yeah, is mostly RSS, RSS feeds. feeds. Yeah, you got yeah, tags all over the place, so you can sign up for certain portions, blogs. We all blog there, that kind of stuff. Blogs or forum content or whatever you want the RSS there. So yeah, we definitely subscribe. Very cool. Hey, I, I was I was the key behind getting RSS on f 5com yeah, too. We're a little <laughs> slow on that. But, <laughs> well, hey, but, you're uh, faster than 99 percent of the rest of the businesses. But, in you know, the, world, the yeah. point is, is that we, we're rolling out Dev Central. We want to integrate some of the, the information that's coming off of our main site, so that yeah. RSS is the, the main way to go. Well, and how, and information about the network is going to, I think, is going to be an interesting service of itself. Mm -hmm. you, know? you look at Google Zeitgeist page, that gets yeah. a lot of traffic because it shows the health of their network. But uh, when Absolutely. we inter implement yeah. services, we're going to have little yeah. health of health of, or information about our services. So information about services will be yeah. a, a traffic yeah, yeah, yeah. aggregator as well. There <laughs> so, you go, and that's kind of what you're talking about here. But that would be yeah. uh, we. 
Yeah, we could look at making an RSS view on top of Big IP, in which case uh, we get you guys fronting uh, Channel 9 with our stuff. Cool. <laughs> cool. So Thanks. this is what that means is he's going to go home tonight. He'll actually probably build and say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and like, wow, how'd that happen? So, well, but, cool. Uh, but thanks for coming over. Yeah. Hey, it's, thanks uh, for spending uh, 45 minutes showing me your lab. Yeah. Show them down in the lab really Do you guys want to look at the lab? We hey, can take we you guys. Well, we forgot to oh. ask the, one of the obvious question. Why F5? Can you explain? <laughs> what does this mean? Uh, it's not the key. You're the you're the uh, you're, you're the, 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 I'm the re resident historian here. Yeah, you're yeah. the historian. Um, rumor has it that our CEO in '96 was watching the movie Twister. Okay. All right. And F5 is is rated as the class highest class uh, of tornado. Yep. So the whole idea with uh, F5 is that we can help avoid disaster and disaster recovery. So yep. tying in, he was watching watching Twister and. Uh, that, that's kind of how the whole F5 came across. Where the ball came in, and um, I, I don't know the history of that. I just think it's really. I, well, I think didn't, it in, well in Twister, devices. didn't they have those balls that were up in the oh. storm to track the storm? Oh, I guess they did. <laughs> didn't they? That's, I, I think they had stuff they tracked. It sounds like a good story. It Go does, with it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny. The customers, uh, they're very particular. If we ever change the color, they complain. Oh, yeah. They love being able to walk into the desert and hey, see well, it right there. You can see right here. You yeah. can see all this. It's stuff. crazy. Yeah. Yeah, you got all the devices in there. Nice. Yeah. Check out the movie. That's what status was, for data was centers. It soft, yeah. What was it? Swordfish. Swordfish. Yeah, swordfish. We're in Swordfish. If you look in the data center at the end with Travolta, they got the big rub balls in there. So, Very yeah, cool. Um, even the movie guys like our... Uh, our uh, so if they don't figure cool. and deploy them, at yeah, least they, they look really good. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. This hey, was a lot of fun. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks.